Welcome to Baby Boomer Tales. My name is Jim. Thank you for riding along today. Somebody the other day asked me to define my podcast. I thought for about one half of a second, so there's no hesitation whatsoever. And I said, it's just some friends of me. We're sitting around a campfire, and it's my turn to tell a story. That's about as descriptive as I can be about Baby Boomer Tales. So sit back and relax. We just threw another log on, and it's my turn to talk. When I was a junior in high school, one of the classes that I took was pottery. Now pottery is you take clay, you get it wet, and you form it, maybe you put it on a wheel and round it, make a nice little soup bowl. If you're younger, and it was the 50s, you made an ashtray. But there was a bunch of us in this class. I can remember it seemed to be all juniors in that class. I'm not really sure. But from what I can remember, there might have been some sophomores. I can't remember any seniors in that class at all. But it was a long time ago, so who knows. I remember there's Billy, and there's Marilyn, there's my buddy Dan. There's a whole bunch of us in that class. And as we were forming our clay and preparing it to make something, sitting there, pushing our fists into it and rolling it over and doing it again kind of like we would with some flour before you bake bread. The whole secret of it was you were pushing and kneading that clay so it get all the air bubbles out of it. That's what the whole purpose of doing all that was for. So it would be easy to form and it go into the kiln and there wouldn't be any problem at all. The second semester was coming to an end. We had a project the last four, five, six weeks of the semester. And it was for our final grade in class that semester. We had to do a major project. Well, I made this thing, and as a form I used, back in the later 60s, R.A. and W. in town, you bought a quart of root beer, and it come in a quart size cardboard container, kind of like, you know, it used to buy milk in. And it was in a cone shape, larger at the bottom and tapered as it went up to the top. And so what I did is I made a form out of three of them, put them one on top of the other, and made a vase, painted it black, drizzled some white on it. Everybody was having real nice projects, but my buddy Dan decided he was going to make a bust out of me. Now when I say a bust, it's just somebody's head. You see those of Benjamin Franklin and things like that. If you go to the National Baseball Hall of Fame, you'll see busts of famous players and whatever. And he decided to do this bust of me for his final project, for his final grade in pottery. Well, do you remember the first time you ever heard your voice on a recording? How you turned to somebody and said, Does that sound like me? You couldn't hardly even believe that you would sound like that. Well, I know we've never ever been able to see ourselves. Not really. You can't see your ears and you can't see your eyes. You can't see your smile. I don't care if you're looking at a reflection of yourself in a still mountain lake or in the mirror in the bathroom or if you even watch yourself on videos. You cannot see yourself in 3D. And so as the bust of myself was being formed, I kept saying to old Dan, that doesn't look like me. My nose is too long there. My ears are... Does that really look like me? Of course, my classmates would say, yes, it looks exactly like you. Dan has really captured you. And I went, I can't look like that. Surely I'm not that ugly. It was a painstaking task Dan took on, where I made my vase pretty much lickety-split. It took Dan weeks and weeks. He'd have to cover the head every night with wet towels and come back during the day and make adjustments and add like my chin or say he'd have to correct my cheekbones, all this stuff. And I was watching the very intimate and personal thing happening to me in the form of that clay bust. 
Pottery class was fun. We'd just stand around and knead the clay and talk and kid each other and everything. We had this teacher, Mr. S, and he was probably an artist since he did have pottery class. And he was one of these guys that thought he was cooler than he probably was. Probably wore paisley shirt and striped pants. He's a nice guy, but his swagger and everything around the females from junior and senior girls clear up to the female teachers was enough to make a guy laugh. And I don't think he much liked me very much. I mean, I whipped out my vase just like that. Didn't take the class very serious at all. I never felt I was very artistic. I was just looking for an easy A. Well, with two weeks left in the school year, it was time to turn our projects over to him to put in the kiln. We had made them. We had glazed them. And all they needed to do now is go through the kiln and the drying process. And then he'd give us our final grade. Well, that was on a Friday. When we came to class on Monday, Mr. S. was very solemn. We all sat down. And he sat on his desk. I remember this. He sat on his desk. And he informed us that Dan's project, the bust of me, had blown up in the kiln and wiped everybody's project out that was in that kiln with him. Now, the class was large enough that there were several firings, and my vase did not happen to be in with my bust. And so it survived. But Dan's project of a statue of me blew everybody's up. And Mr. S. flunked both Dan and me on our projects. So I went up to him, and I said, my project did not blow up. Here's my project. And he said, I don't care. You were involved with that bust and likeness of yourself. You have received an F in pottery. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. I was angry. Dan was devastated. I told him he shouldn't have done a bust of me in the first place, but he didn't listen. I guess if it had turned out right, we could have something in my living room to this day. And here's the rub. That vase that I made all those years ago sat in my parents' living room for years and years, and after they passed, I acquired it, and it's been sitting in mine ever since. Pottery was one of those classes that if you were a shy person, it would have been hard to be in that class because everyone just talked and kidded each other, wanted to find out your business, and they were all in your business for about 45 minutes, five days a week. I wouldn't say that I liked that class, and I really did think I would going into it, and I definitely didn't get an easy A. Since I got a C or a B the first semester, I did not flunk pottery class, so I didn't have to take it over. Thank goodness. Mr. S., wherever you are out there, I hope you found the perfect woman for you. I know you were probably a nice enough guy, and just because I didn't like you, doesn't mean a thing. I forgive you for flunking me, and I ask for your forgiveness for me being so difficult. It's a good life, Mr. S. It really is. Dan, if you're listening to this, you never asked to do another bust. I don't blame you at all. I miss those days, old buddy. In my senior year of high school, always looking for that elusive easy A, I took a class called Library Science. Now, Library Science was always reserved for seniors. I guess it was something like a little reward for making it that far through the public school system. And so I signed up, and I got the class. And there were all kinds of my friends in there, Connie and Sherry, Roxanne, Dad once again. Wayne was in there. There were all kinds of us. There's probably 15 kids all the seniors taking that class. And what it was, more than anything, is we learned how to be a librarian. Now, my friend Wayne ended up being a professional librarian after he finished all of his education. That's where he ended up. We had to learn the Dewey Decimal System. It was always there, kind of on top of you, you know, but really understanding it was a whole different matter. And so now we had to learn it. We repaired books. We maintained the library, like dusting and straightening and making sure everything is in its rightful place. Our teacher was Mrs. Ogden. She was an older lady, 
And I know I never use people's last names on this podcast. But Mrs. Ogden is long gone. She has to be. She was very old when I was in high school. I really liked her. She always had a smile and laugh at your stupid jokes. She's no nonsense as far as the library went, though. And it was a good class for me that year. Well, repairing books, you use the product called rubber cement. Does anybody remember rubber cement? You could fix all kinds of stuff. It was a kind of a flexible glue. If a book came back and its cover had been ripped away from the, the body of the book, you could put rubber cement down the spine of it, patch it all together, let it set for a couple of days, and it was just good as new again. We use rubber cement all the time there in the library, repairing books. Well, one day I was back in a little cubby with a stack of books I was repairing with rubber cement, and I was kind of all by myself. And that was my project for the day. Smelling on that rubber cement. Ooh, that smells good. Breathing it in a little deeper. Putting my nose a little closer. Doing that for 20 or 30 minutes. All of a sudden, I was kind of high. Hey, this is kind of cool. Kind of breathe it in. Nice deep breaths. And I got a little higher and it was a little cooler. I started kind of laughing. I don't think I got many books repaired that day. Well, that night, I had a basketball game. So that must have been on a Friday, possibly. It was a home game. I remember that. My senior year, I was a starter on the basketball team. And I got out there, still all high as a kite from this rubber cement. And I was messing stuff up really bad, passing it to the ref or giving the ball to the opposition or shooting at the wrong baskets, little stupid stuff, and they sat me down. Coach said, you okay? Yeah, Coach, I'm fine. Okay, take it easy, take a breath. Coach, I can play. Okay, go back in there for Wayne. I went in there. All of a sudden, the ball went out of bounds, and ref stand there with the ball in his left hand, waiting to give it to us, and I was the guy who took it out on the sideline, throw it in, inbounds into play and I kept standing over on his right side. Ref looked at me and said, get on the other side of me. Take the ball. I'd look at him. I'd go, I'm on your other side. Well, finally we got called for a penalty and gave the ball to the other team. Then I was out there. I crashed into a guy and I fell down and I was saying, hey Dan, can you help me up? I can't get up. Laughing. Well, coach pulled me, and I found myself basically on the end of the bench for the rest of the season. I really didn't play much anymore, and I definitely didn't start. Rubber cement was the downfall of my basketball career. I thought I was pretty good. I probably thought I was better than I was, though. And once you hit that plateau in life, it's always downhill from there. Teachers shape you in life. For better or for worse, I was very fortunate I had some great teachers that really helped me through a difficult time in my life. And that difficult time in my life was I just wanted to join the peace love movement and I didn't really much care about anything else. I always kid that sports and girls kept me in school and kept me going right. But really, when you think about it, I really think it was a handful of teachers there. You can find us at babyboomertales.com. Once there, there are links where you can find our podcast, several other things, including our shop tales and Amazon store. There is also a link that says my book, and it is a book that I wrote six years ago, I believe now. It tells about a situation I had in life that really changed my life. If I was to describe it at all, it's like a three or four hour podcast of Baby Boomer Tales. I believe the price for the paperback is eight ninety five, and it's worth every nickel of it, in my opinion. Kindness is all that really matters, simply because it falls in line with all that's good and right. I'll be back next Wednesday. Peace out.